Awesome, awesome. Well, we're so glad that you're here for our Hope for Mental Health community. And you're in for a real treat today uh, because we do have um, Dr. David Mikulovitz with us. And uh, again, this I, I've, seen the, uh, I've seen the PowerPoint notes and uh, you're in for a treat. This is gonna be really good, uh, especially on a, on a really important topic and uh, one that's misunderstood quite a bit. So uh, we're really excited to have him here and for us to be here together. Uh, before we get started, let me just open us in a word of prayer, if I could. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. Uh, we thank you so much. I mean, just the fact that we get together to talk about this here at church. Uh, there's not, not a ton of places where this is happening, and we are so blessed, Lord, that we get to do this here, that we get to share, uh, learn together, and support one another uh, on this journey that we're all on, Father. And so uh, I just ask that your presence would be here. We pray that you would guide our time together and that uh, as we leave, that we'll leave with more uh, information, but also encouragement. So we give all of this to you and thank you for your love and presence in your name. Amen. All right, a couple of things. Uh, those of you that, uh, that need it, because I know this is one of the most important things, the bathroom. I always start with that. It's downstairs at the very bottom level in that corner. So if you go out that door or around to the elevator, you're going to go over there, okay? So it's down over there. Uh, a couple other things. You can see we have uh, food over here and snacks. Feel free to grab whatever you want when you need it. Uh, we also have our Celebrate Recovery table back there. If you want information on Celebrate Recovery, we also have a resource table in the back with various books and things to check out. And so I'd welcome you to go uh, take a look at those things as well. And then on your table, you see we have an agenda, a page for notes, and, uh, and some guidelines for table discussion. So what I want to do is get you started with uh, your table discussion uh, together. And so you notice we've got a couple of questions there. What do you hope to learn today in our time together? And what has your experience been with bipolar disorder? All right. So go ahead and share that around your tables. If you're by yourself, maybe join another table or you can talk to yourself, it's up to you. Welcome back. I love to hear all the chatter. That means you guys are connecting and lots of, lots of good stuff. Hopefully it's about the topics we put on the tape. No, I'm teasing. It's okay if you get to know each other too. That's great. So we're going to have uh, Dave Page come up. He's going to lead us in a devotional. Come on up, uh, Pastor Dave Page. It's a scarf day, don't you think? I see a lot of scarves. I'm like, I love a good scar uh, scarf, and so, but I'm not going to talk to you about that. I um, want to talk just a few minutes about perspective. How many were in one of the worship services today? Uh, then you heard Stacy talk about perspective. It's a mindset. It's how we view things. It's a point of view. And the question is, so what is your point of view? What is your perspective when you face painful things, when you face difficulties in your life, when you're going up against something that seems maybe overwhelming? How do you develop a perspective on that? We get perspective from our culture. We get perspective from education, from life experiences. But I think maybe the best way is from our faith. It's what we believe and what we believe about God in particular and God's plan for our life. And so the verse I want to use for perspective is Ephesians 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 10. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. Uh, one translation says his handiwork or workmanship created anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things, works that he planned for us long ago. So the idea there, the, the word is poem. So it's like you're, you're a poem, you're God's poem, you're God's song, you're God's masterpiece, a work of art that he's created that's unique, and he has works for you to do. Before he said we're saved by grace in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, no man can boast, and he says we're saved then for good works prepared in advance before the world was even created. 
So you get a kind of a sense of destiny, that God's created you special, unique. The experiences that are going to happen, that have happened, that will happen to you, are part of his plan, and he wants to use those for good, for good works to glorify him. And so I had a, a, a very good friend, uh, Coach John Wooden, and he used to say, make each day your masterpiece. And I love that. I love that. And so in my life, um, uh, I found out two years ago, I was diagnosed with leukemia. And it kind of came out of nowhere. I had a routine joint surgery. And three days later, the orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Marindola, called me at home, and he doesn't usually call you. It's not like good news when he calls you. Usually his PA or a nurse or somebody calls you. And so he says, you know, the, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing great. Sir. I'm, everything's great. He said, well, I'm really sorry to tell you this. We sent, you know, what they took out to pathology, and we got it back, and you have CLL leukemia, uh, chronic lymphos lymphostatic leukemia. And... Um, and boy, it was, I was alone. Uh, we'd gone out to dinner with my daughter, Jessica. She was down from uh, Ventura County here to Orange County. And they'd gone to the mall. She'd gone to the mall with my wife. And so uh, I called her, my wife. I said, uh, I got something to tell you. You need to come home. And she said, no, 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 just tell me. I said, no, I, I can't tell you. You got to come home. And they came home. And we got my son on FaceTime. And I, I told them. And they cried. And we didn't know. You know, when I was a kid, leukemia was like a death sentence, you know, and, and so I didn't know if I had three days or three weeks or three years to live, and um, it, was, it was one of those times when my daughter was getting married. She was our first one to get married. She got married last summer, and I said, no matter what, sweetie, I'm going to be there, but I didn't know, and the whole thing has been uh, an amazing thing. Um, I went to the oncologist after that and found out because it was chronic, it is the kind, it's one that you can live with. Um, they did all the tests of my white blood cell and lymph nodes and all that. And I'm, they said I'm stage zero to one. And so I'm like very early detection. Uh, I just go every six months. And, um, and then if it's good, I wait and go another six months. I've had no treatment yet. Uh, but going through that, it's been kind of this facing your own mortality and as Stacy said, you know, we're not guaranteed, uh, you know, tomorrow. Nobody has that. Uh, so we don't know what's going to come. And then I decided, when do I tell people? Um, I didn't, I decided not to tell people right away because I had the diagnosis, but I didn't really know the prognosis until, you know, at least six months later. I mean, if it would have been acute and I was dying the next day, I, obviously we would have told people we didn't. And so then it was time to tell people, and, it, and we'd say, who do you tell first, other than immediate family, who we told not to tell people? Um, and so I told Pastor Tom and, and Shondell. And so we sat down with them, just alone, me and Carrie, and we told them, and it was like silent. And then Shondell goes, she goes, is that it? And I go, yeah. She goes, oh, I thought you were going to leave staff. And... <laughs> And Tom, and Tom goes, Shondell, he just told us he has leukemia. And she goes, oh, I know. It was so funny. It was so funny. We, we laughed about it. It was all this tense, and then it just broke the ice. And then I told Pastor Rick, and uh, it was before our service. We were meeting outside, and, and I shared with Pastor Rick. And he just, he was shocked. He said, Dave, I'm shocked. He said, and I just want you to know I, I love you. And he just had, he just had tears uh, coming down his cheek. And, um, and so it's been a, a process now. It's been two years, and it's, it's gone really well. But it just made me think, I want to make each day my masterpiece. And my perspective on it is, I'm living with leukemia. I'm not dying with leukemia. I'm living. And God had this. This is part of the plan. God didn't cause it, but it's part of his plan. And so I want to use my life to help people who have had terminal diagnosis for God's glory, I want to use it to help grieving people, those who are in grief. I've watched Kay over the years, uh, just so admire her, and I've watched her start this Hope for Mental Health community. And I thought we need one similar but in a different way for grieving people, those who've lost loved ones, the bereaved of Saddleback. So last month we started Hope for Grief. 
And uh, we had 167 people come to that. It shows the need that we have for that. And I'm so excited. And I just want to spend the rest of my life doing that. So I'm living with leukemia. You're living with what you got for God's glory. Amen? Amen. All right. Thanks so much, Dave. All right. Well, we have uh, the, the privilege of having a testimony today from our very own Christy Wiseman. Come on up, Christy. I know, you, I know you're looking forward to this. Uh, Christy runs one of our family grace support groups and also is involved with uh, Be Well OC. So come on up, Christy. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to do this. All right. <laughs> so... Um, I've never actually put this together as like a testimony before and trying to get it in five minutes, so just bear with me. Um, but I wanted to give you a little bit of background. Like many of us, I grew up in a broken home from a really young age, and um, I remember always yearning for like a normal life like my kids had or my friends had, um, you know, where their mom made their lunch for school each day and um, chaperoned on field trips and tucked them in at night and all that kind of stuff. And, um, but that was something I always hoped for. It wasn't really my reality. And that's totally not meant to be a sob story. Just wanted to give you a little bit of background. But uh, my husband, Eric, and I, we got married really young and had four kids in the first five years. And being so young and not really having that role model, um, I wanted to create that family that I wished that I had. So I did everything um, that I could think of. We signed up for marriage classes. I went to Bible studies to learn from other family members. Um, we did parenting classes. We did, um, I devoured like every book on every subject of being like the Christian wife and mom. And um, anyway, I did anything I could think of. And I'm pretty good um, at rule following. I'm like, like the agenda that you put out. Um, <laughs> so, and I was thinking of, of it kind of like a vending machine, you know, you, you follow the right rules and you, you put in the required amount of money and you push the right button and then you get the result that you expect. And so that's what I did. I put in, you know, the time and the love and the discipline and, and the prayer and the, you know, um, dinners at the table and stories at bedtime and hugs and all that stuff. Um, I figured if I did that, I'd get the result I expected, but, um, and I have to say, Eric worked really hard, and I was fortunate enough to stay home and, and try to do all that, um, but what I got was not what I expected. One of our kids, um, he was extremely, extremely challenging from about the age of two, and um, of course, it was really, really hard on him, but it also severely impacted his siblings and definitely our marriage as well. And I often felt discouraged and kind of paralyzed with fear and not knowing what the right thing to do was because if I knew the right thing, I would do it and then we'd see results and then we wouldn't have a problem. We could have this perfect family and that didn't happen. So, um, but I really felt just out of control and kind of like a failure most of the time. Um, it wasn't until he was 11 that we found out from doctors that what he was struggling with was mental illness and it wasn't something that we were doing wrong as parents. And, um, I never anticipated having a child with mental illness, and, and I definitely wasn't prepared with all the classes I took and the books I read. Those were not in those. And so I remember saying often, like, I'm literally living my dream, meaning, you know, I've got this great husband and these four kids, and I get to stay home, and I get to volunteer, and I get to do all the things. But I'd be like, I'm literally living my dream, but I never, ever knew it was going to be this hard. It was really hard. Um, and as the years went on and the doctors tried to find the right medication and therapy, well, I over here was trying every alternative therapy I could think of because we were going to fix it. Um, he was still struggled. He struggled in school and at home and with friends. And it wasn't the typical struggles that I would hear about from other moms. You know, these were extreme. And um, it was heartbreaking and it was exasperating. And we were trying so hard to do all the right things, and then we were being judged by, you know, other people, especially, you know, it was people in the church that I looked, toor looked towards for as mentors and guides and people to help us along the way. And those were the people that were actually saying what we're doing was wrong, and it, it was very, very hurtful. Um, but there was nothing, you know, there was nothing we could do. But 
As time's gone on, it hasn't necessarily gotten easier, but I have learned a few things. I'm going to share two. Um, when we've walked through the seasons of crisis and seemingly, seemingly hopeless, hopeless suffering onto unknown roads without a clue how to navigate them, by the way, um, I've learned something that sounds kind of contrary to a typical phrase in Christian circles, and that is that God does give us more than we can handle. The daily struggles were more than I can handle. The confusion and the unknowns were more than I could handle. The humiliation of failure was more than I could handle. And sometimes the answers were more than I could handle as well. Um, someone once told me that the answers were invitations into God's plans, teaching me when God gives us more than we can handle, he's inviting us into what might be our greatest life purpose, which is to be God's fellow workers. And through God bringing other people into our lives with similar stories and using our family's lived experiences, he's brought us on a journey that allows us to partner with, with him as guides, as map makers, as cheerleaders for those that we meet along the journey. And now I'm, I'm really grateful seeing all that God has done and continues to do through our family's experience. And there's still times where I'm like, God, this is way more than I can handle. And that's good because that's exactly where he wants me. He wants me fully reliant on him. So um, some people have asked me, like, what do you do? How do you keep going on when, when God gives you more than you can handle? And I would say the crises that often took place in our home, they were pretty normal for us. And as, as things, um, as he got older and things started escalating, um, Eric and I really felt like we needed help. We, um, we felt completely alone and isolated. Um, we withdrew from, from people we knew because it was, it was just a lot and nobody really could understand. Um, but that we needed, we knew we needed help kind of navigating this road up ahead. And um, so we were introduced to a group of family members kind of walking along similar paths that we experienced. We experienced firsthand what it was like to, to receive and to give support and to carry and be carried by others. And um, by the way, shameless plug, that's Family Grace Group. You can ask me afterwards. Um, but second, we, we've seen that our path can directly provide a way for those traveling behind us. So, so we were like drafted into this life, this experience that we never would have signed up for, but um, God continues to grow, grow us and build new strength but also for him to show his, his power and his strength and his sustainable grace in our lives. And ultimately, we rest in knowing that, um, that he does um, have a plan and, hope, and he is the hope and, and the hope he gives is sure. And he's gone before us and he just continues to kind of, he pays, paves the way. And um, one time Eric and I watched a movie called, it was, I don't know, 10 years ago, Collateral Beauty. And the idea of collateral beauty is that no matter how dark or how difficult the time is, there's something beautiful that is happening and we just need to look for it. And it felt like God was asking if I was willing to be humble to the point of humiliation, but not blinded to the wisdom and beauty to be discovered, kind of like finding diamonds in those dark, deep, hidden places. Hebrews 10.23 says, um, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess because he who promised is faithful. And as our family's journey continues and we continue to hold on to that hope unswervingly, and um, we're just really grateful that God has provided us with a community of trailblazers to walk along with. So thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Christy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dave, for sharing. You guys, I get the great privilege of introducing our speaker today. Dr. Um, David Miklowitz is going to read this to you because it's worth reading. Okay, so listen. Um, hi, Chip. Just noticed you. Hi. Good to see you. Sorry. Chip's my friend. Okay. Um, <laughs> and he's a great cook, by the way. Okay. Dr. Miklowitz is a distinguished professor of psychiatry and director of the Child and Adolescent Mood Disorders Program at the UCLA School of Medicine. He's also a visiting professor of psychiatry at Oxford University in the UK. His research focuses on family environmental factors and family interventions for children, adolescents, and adults with bipolar disorder and youth at high risk for mood disorders or psychosis. 
His work has helped establish the effectiveness of psychosocial interventions in the treatment of bipolar disorder across age ranges. He has received numerous awards for his research and writings, most recently the Mood Disorders Research Award from the American College of Psychiatrists, one of only two psychologists to have done so. He has received multiple grants for his research from the National Institute of Mental Health and 10 private foundations, published over 350 journal articles, <laughs> chapters, and eight books. And on top of that, Dr. Mikowitz is a very kind and empathetic physician and man, and I'm so glad that we get to welcome him today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mikowitz. Go ahead, go ahead, I'm gonna tell. I forgot to tell you that he is gonna share some amazing slides and there might be a little difficult to see from the back, but he is very generously offered to make them available. So don't sweat it if you can't take notes fast enough. They'll be available on the Hope for Mental Health site and on kwarren.com. And he also said that he would stay after and talk for a little bit if you had something you wanted to ask him personally. So thank you, Dr. Mikowitz. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. This is actually the third time I've spoken here. I've enjoyed it a great deal every time. Now, when I start talking, I tend to start talking slower, you know, and quieter and quieter. So I usually appoint someone in the back to go like this if I need to talk louder. So will somebody do that for me? No middle fingers, please. Just the, just, just the thumb. Okay? Thank you. Appreciate it. So. I'm the director of the Child and Adolescent Mood Disorders Program at UCLA. We see uh, kids between the ages of 9 and 17 and their families, usually with either depression or bipolar disorder. What I want to do is kind of take you uh, on a trip through bipolar disorder. What is it? How does it affect kids? How does it affect adults? How does it affect families? Since many of you are family members, I know, who have somebody who has bipolar disorder. And what can you do about it? What do we know about treatment? What do we know about uh, different strategies for managing the disorder? And is there anything good about it? There actually is, as you'll see in a moment as I talk about creativity. So if I could have the first slide, and there'll be plenty of time to ask questions, and as Kay said, there'll be, uh, these will be available on the website. So I think we're all familiar with symptoms of depression. Uh, this, by the way, is a handout we use in our treatment when we're working with kids. We just hand this to them and say, which of these symptoms do you recognize? And many of them will pipe up and say, yes, I've been depressed. Certainly during the pandemic, we saw a lot of this. But just from every day being a child or an adolescent, uh, we know depression is pretty common. About one in every 10 teenagers gets depression, a severe depression, severe enough that it interferes with school, for example. Uh, Interestingly, probably 30 years ago, we didn't believe that kids could get depressed. We thought that was, they weren't old enough cognitively to be able to have a depressive episode. That's now been debunked. We know that uh, kids can get depressed. And we also know that a subgroup can get manic, as we call it. If I could have the next slide. I think I'll sit down so I can see these. Um, mania is as you probably know, a more activated, heightened state where people become very, kids become very uh, talkative and grandiose. Uh, sometimes they develop grandiose delusions um, or uh, they seem unusually happy. And by the way, these same symptoms can affect an adult or an adolescent or an elderly person. It really can cut across the age ranges. We uh, see loss of self-control, spending an awful lot of money, getting in car accidents, doing very risky things, sometimes for a week, sometimes for two weeks, cycling back and forth with depressive episodes. And in the clearest case, kids or adults will have depressions followed by manias, followed by depressions, with a period of relatively good functioning in, in between. But even so, we see people who have believe it or not, mania and depression at the same time, if you can imagine that, feeling sad, feeling slowed down, but your mind is going very fast, and you're jumping from topic to topic when you speak uh, or have unrealistic beliefs about the future. So this is a, one of the more well-recognized disorders that we have in our, uh, our catalog, so to speak. Next slide. 
Now, one of the things that's misunderstood about bipolar disorder, especially when you read about it in a newspaper, they usually talk about the mania because it's more exciting, it's more interesting, it's more newsworthy. But the reality is, is that people with bipolar disorder spend most of their time depressed. And that's partly because our medications don't work as well for, for depression as they do for mania. You can bring someone down from a mania with heavy hitting medications like antipsychotics, lithium, uh, other medications, uh, usually in a couple of weeks. In depression, it's a slower burn, and many people come out of the hospital depressed, not able to function. I thought I was over it, but I'm not. So that, this is a big issue uh, that we face. So about three times more time spent depressed than spent manic. Next slide. What about kids? Well, we know about 2% of kids have some form of bipolar disorder. That doesn't mean they have severe depressions and severe mania. Some of them have depressions with more moderate levels of mania we call hypomania, which is more a state of being activated, being having grandiose thinking, but not to the point where it might get them thrown out of school or someone would say, you need to see a doctor. It's more like an agitated state. Their, their peers may comment on it. I remember uh, a case I worked on. I used to be at University of Colorado where everyone went skiing all the time and the, uh, the kids would say, there was one kid who said, my friends always know when I'm hypomanic because when we go skiing, they, I always bring, a, bring in the ski patrol. Somehow the ski patrol gets involved whenever I go skiing. That's because I jump off this cliff or I do this turn and then I get hurt or something and my, my friends don't even want to go skiing with me anymore because this keeps happening. And that's, that's more like hypomania, this sort of high functioning or, or high activity. Uh, the, the problem with this disorder is it leads to all sorts of dysfunction in school, for the family, for peer relationships, for sibling relationships, and it's very difficult to deal with as a parent. Uh, we know there are some medications that we can give them, but not everybody wants to start their child or adolescent on severe medications. We know there's a high rate of suicide attempts and a high rate of suicide. This is one of the psychiatric disorders that has the highest rate of suicide, especially if there's also substance abuse involved. So if you have someone who's in, say, in their mid-40s and has bipolar disorder and is also an alcoholic and has anxiety, I'm worried about that person, about uh, them committing suicide ultimately. Uh, we also know this is hard to recognize. Lots of kids and, ad and adults go years before they're properly diagnosed. Why is that? Because sometimes they see a psychiatrist who says, well, it's depression. Depression is common and that's what you've got and they miss the mania. And there's some problems with that kind of misdiagnosis. One of which is if they give you an antidepressant when you're depressed, it can send you up it can send you into mania. So we have to be very careful how we diagnose it. Next slide. So here's an example. This is a 10-year-old girl describing what mania is like. She says, when I feel happy, I get real bouncy. I'm hopping all over the place. My mind seems to be focused on one thing for a short time. Sometimes I don't necessarily feel uh, bouncy, just kind of light and airy, like a butterfly. I flit and float from place to place, physically and in my mind. But when I'm depressed, I'm like dead. I sit there lifelessly, my body float, sort of flops around like a beanie baby. Also, my mind just sort of drifts away and wanders aimlessly into space. So that's, this is a 10-year-old girl. She's describing this pretty well, I would say, about what it's like to have this sort of heightened, aggravated state. It's not necessarily a fun state. People talk about mania as being a lot of fun, and it can be because you can feel very powerful and full of ideas and very creative, but it could also be very anxiety provoking. Many people say their manias are scary, that they're, they're like a, a train running off its track or a, a carousel going too fast. So next slide. So here are the kinds of uh, complications we run into. Is this grandiosity or is this childhood playfulness? So here's a case. Five-year-old girl is helped down from a roof at school. She explains that she has 500 brothers, half of them live on the moon, that her teachers have told her it's okay to play on the roof at recess. The moon talks to me sometimes. 
That's an example of mania. In this case, it was a five-year-old girl. How about we go to 10 years old? A 10-year-old boy jumps up in front of the classroom, claims he can teach the class better than any teacher, then tells the class to turn to page 12 in their book. He gets irritable and combative when interrupted. Now, by itself, we would say this is mania. We'd have to do a full history, find out if there's, for example, a decreased need for sleep. I didn't mention that earlier. During mania, people don't sleep much at all. They may sleep a couple of hours, or they may not sleep at all. Uh, in depression, we can either see people being unable to sleep, uh, even though they want to, but, uh, or they're sleeping all the time. That's the more common, particularly during the winter. One of the ways we diagnose this is we say, okay, so you're only sleeping four hours a night. Do you feel tired the next day? If they say yes, it's more likely to be a depression. If they say no, it's more likely to be a mania. So uh, the third example, 16-year-old says he's developing a live version of Google Earth, that he intends to breed a phosphorescent horse. Uh, his live version, he said, was he was going to connect up to all the cameras that are already there, all the security cameras, and be able to watch people in their homes. He said he was working on this, and it was very well elaborated, sort of grandiose delusion. Uh, that's the sort of thing we say, we see. So how does this all affect the family? Well, uh, the teen or the young person can get very aggressive, particularly with siblings. If there's a lot of family conflict, that puts the kid at more risk for a more, another episode. And these things do come in episodes, as I mentioned. You go from depression to mania to depression uh, to a, a mixed episode, perhaps. Uh, the teens often self-isolate during depression. Nobody can talk to them. They're in their room playing video games all the time or talking once in a while to a friend. Uh, of course, what kid isn't playing video games all the time, right? So how do you know? Well, if they won't come out of their room, they won't join you for dinner, and there's a sort of slow, sluggish uh, quality to them uh, where they don't want to talk or they're looking down while they're eating, that, that's more likely what we see in depression. Uh, we may see an effect on siblings. Siblings may start acting out. You always pay attention to him. He's always causing all this trouble in the family. Uh, what about me? And then sometimes the siblings act out to try to bring attention to themselves. The family can feel isolated. Like, who do I talk to about this? I don't know about anybody else whose kid has bipolar disorder. Well, you know, I'm glad to hear there are groups like this where you can meet other people who have. Um, but up until recently, those weren't available. The people who suffer the most, of course, are parents because they're taking care of these kids. They, they get physically exhausted, depressed themselves, sometimes develop physical illnesses trying to take care of this kid or kids. Sometimes there's more than one. And we know this, this disorder runs in families. So sometimes a parent may have the disorder themselves or a variant of it, or there may be someone further back in the family tree. Uh, next slide, please. This was given to me by a mother of a 16-year-old with bipolar disorder. She said, you want to know what it's like to be a mother of a 16-year-old? Well, this pretty much sums it up, doctor. Uh, that's me on that string. My son is like a big baby puppeteer keeping me on a string, all of us on a string, with his vicious mood swings. And worst of all, he seems delighted that he can do it. There is a sense of disempowerment that parents feel because they don't get the answers for the mental health system. Uh, they try to introduce controls. They're told, well, you know, maybe they, they're told, you need to discipline him more. You need to set firmer limits. You need to have clear expectancy. Well, with bi something like bipolar disorder, none of that stuff's going to work. So it's not like we were born with a parenting manual for dealing with these kinds of problems. Next slide. This is my daughter. Uh, she's 23 in this picture. I went for a walk with her. She's a, phot a photographer by trade. And I said, give me your best bipolar face. She gave me this face. I took a picture quickly. And I'm using this to illustrate how are, are all teenagers bipolar? I mean, teenagers are known for their mood swings, right? For their reactivity, for their family conflict, for their sort of novelty seeking and so forth. Next slide. How is being bipolar different from being a normal teenager? That's a, a big issue that, that uh, families run across. 
We define teen years, by the way, up until about 1890, the, the term teenager or adolescent didn't exist. It was, it's a product of the, the 20th century that we talk in terms of childhood, toddlerhood, adolescence, and so on as being separate phases of development. Uh, what really characterize healthy teenage years are there's an increase in risk taking, there's an increase in irritability and mood instability, and there's an increase in family conflict. Most people who have a teenager can attest to that. But all these things are greatly magnified in bipolar disorder. So you see not only is there uh, mood instability, but it's so wide that it ends up disturbing family functioning. The family conflict can be knock down, drag out fights. Uh, it's not unusual for teenagers to sexually experiment where when kids are, uh, are bipolar, they may engage in unsafe and very risky sex with multiple partners, substance abuse. Okay, so teenagers may smoke a joint once in a while, but we're talking about kids who may get be in their room uh, getting high and eating gummies and all that other stuff uh, from very early on. We see deterioration in functioning. That's really the way to tell it apart. Any of these symptoms can occur individually in a teenager, irritability, sexuality, excessive sexuality, uh, inappropriate reactions, but when they occur together with sleep disturbance, uh, difficulty functioning in school, uh, thoughts going fast, all the other symptoms, that's when we start thinking this is an illness. It, uh, the definition of an illness is it has to, in, or mental illness anyways, it has to impair functioning, or otherwise we just call it a symptom. So, uh, next slide. What do we do about this? So we have a program at UCLA we call Family Focused Treatment. It's called FFT. It's usually, if it's a bipolar adolescent or young adult or child, we usually combine it with medications. Not always, uh, and it's partly up to the family. So we start with a diagnostic interview. We start with a psychiatric interview. A psychiatrist will interview the kid and the parents and say, okay, well, I think this child would benefit from uh, lithium or lamotrigine, that's another one that we use, uh, it's anti-seizure medication that has mood stabilizing effects, or an antipsychotic medication, or uh, let's wait and see, let's see how this develops over time. But it's not unusual for the kid to be on medications. But then we offer the family 12 sessions by themselves, we don't do this in groups of families, we do it one at a time. And it's focused on three things. One is learning about the disorder, uh, very much like what we're talking about here. How do you cope with it? How do you know when the kid is getting worse? How do you develop a relapse prevention plan? Um, what causes it? What are the things you can do at home to try to improve it, which I'm about to tell you? Uh, how do we communicate as a family? What are some good ways to communicate? How do we listen? How do we ask people to respect our, own, our behavior as well as take care of themselves, uh, how, how do you mix positive and negative feedback? All that good family communication stuff plays a very big role in this treatment, as does problem solving. How are we gonna get you back to school? You're not, you haven't gone to school because you keep sleeping in, because you're tired, you're depressed. What are we gonna do as a family to cope with that? This is our family-focused therapy. Uh, next slide, please. And what are we after? Our, the holy grail here is recovery. We aren't saying that we're gonna cure someone of bipolar disorder. What we want them to do first is have fewer recurrences and to have a high quality of life despite symptoms. That's across mental illnesses, that's usually what we think of is can you function, can you reach your life goals even though you have to deal with these illnesses, uh, the, the sort of waxing wing. I thought Dave Page's uh, comments about you know, your experience with illness is a very good example of that. How do you make a quality of life despite having an illness that, that could be threatening? How do you have satisfaction in school and family and peer domains? How can you uh, uh, accept lifestyle modifications? Maybe you can't be one who stays up all night partying with your friends because that might trigger an episode of bipolar disorder. How do you deal with stigma? Um, uh, learning to cope with stigma. Uh, by stigma, I mean what other people think of mental illness or what they 
they uh, attribute to you if you tell them you're mentally ill. I can't tell you how many patients I've had who say, as soon as I told people at work that I had bipolar disorder, well, they were really kind and understanding, but then I got fired. And then, or then uh, people were asking me, are you being manic right now? Is that why you're upset at this meeting or this new policy? Or uh, people will interpret an ordinary negative interaction you ma might have with a colleague as suddenly that's your bipolar disorder talking. Uh, at the child level, things like this happen. Bobby has a, um, a breakdown at his friend's house where he loses control of his temper, throws things. Mom calls up his friend's mother and says, I want to explain Bobby has bipolar disorder. He was manic that day and um, we're giving him medication. I'm sorry he caused all this trouble. The other mother says, I understand, I understand. You know, we understand about mental illness. Bobby's a wonderful boy. And guess what? Bobby never gets invited over again because of, that's what I mean by stigma. How does having the illness itself affect your ability to get along, have peers, have good relationships, get what you want out of life. I'll say more about that in a moment. Next slide. The good news here, and I'm not gonna show you a lot of data, but I do wanna show you this one. We've now followed kids who looked bipolar for as long as four years. It's not that long, but they started out, say at 12, age 13, 12, and we're, they're now sort of at the uh, pre-college level. And there's about a third of them that are doing pretty well, that they're essentially uh, recovered. Um, it's not a lot, but when you add that to the 17% who are only moderately ill, so about half of them do pretty well over time. There's another half that are ill constantly and go in and out of episodes, have never really found the right medication regimen. We don't know what's gonna happen to them in the future. They may straighten out. Some people do straighten out by the time they're in their late teens, early 20s but we know that they have a more serious form of the illness. I think the take home for that though is you never know that whether or not this is going to keep showing up in adulthood. Some kids do seem to be clear of it by the time they're in their early 20s or late teens. Next slide. Um, this is the one you'll probably wanna uh, download from the, uh, the website. These are the 11 principles we call it for managing bipolar disorder as a family. I'm gonna talk about some of these in more detail. Monitoring moods is one. Learning to recognize early warning signs. Uh, developing what we call a mania prevention plan as a family. Knowing your position on medications, which is different for a family than saying, take your medications. People have strong feelings about these medications and what they do and the side effects. And some of them are diff very difficult to take. They cause weight gain and shakiness of the hands and acne and various other types of things. But there are also ways to adjust them so that they're more uh, uh, acceptable. Um, uh, working with the school on reasonable accommodations, making sure there's a therapist as well as a psychiatrist involved. And remembering as a family, always make sure to take care of yourself and others in the family. You have to make sure you have your escapes if you're a parent, the, the yoga class, the uh, time with friends, the time meditating out in the hills, whatever it is, playing tennis, whatever it is you do that's a stress reliever. That's very important to keep aboard when you have a, ki a kid with this kind of illness. So I'm gonna go through some of these. Next slide. Um, here's an example of a mood chart. This mood chart was developed by a 13-year-old girl in our clinic. Uh, we asked her, how would you like to track your moods on a daily basis? She didn't like terms like mania and depression. I can't imagine why not. Uh, she liked terms like super hyper and energized and balanced and angry. And she kept track of her mood over the course of a week and even tracked her sleep and wake cycles and what happened. Uh, she had an argument with her parents. Uh, um, something else happened later in the week. She partied with her friends or something. You, we get kids to keep track of their own mood swings and sometimes their parents to do the same. So everybody's on the same page about what this looks like when you're in an episode, when you're not. Uh, that's one of the first things I would do. And by the way, these are all now, at, there are apps you can download where you keep track of a kid's bipolar mood swings. Those are very handy if you can get the kid in the habit 
or the adult in the habit of doing it. Um, how can the family help? Well, one way is to get the person in tr into treatment, and that's no small matter, because you may call and find out all the doctors are full, uh, or they don't take insurance. Unfortunately, in Los Angeles especially, uh, private practitioners don't seem to take insurance anymore, and they want you to pay out of pocket. And it's $400 for a psychiatry session, $300 or so for a therapy session. Who can afford that? Not very many people. So there are, all, there are community mental health centers, of course, and there are certain specialty clinics where you can get uh, less expensive care, but that is a problem with the healthcare system, lack of access often among the people who need it the most. Um, uh, getting uh, on the same page about the disorder and what it looks like, that's one way the family can help. This is, uh, this is a manic episode I'm seeing, or you sound like you're getting manic. You can overuse that, but it's very important to be able to have that open communication. Or you seem depressed right now. What can I do to help you? What can I do to get you into your senior therapist? Or is there anything I can do to make home, the home life easier for you? Um, you're having trouble with school, with this particular teacher. Would you like me to have a conversation with that teacher? And keeping the environment low key. That's an important thing is that when the person, when this youngster or young adult even is having an episode, that's not the time to make big family decisions about where you're gonna move to or, um, or, or to uh, uh, say, you know, it's either up or out, you have to get out now or you know, unless you're gonna do this or that. Those, those kinds of conversations are better, best left for the periods in between episodes when the person is, uh, is doing better. Um, reducing expectations. So when they're in a depressed episode, you can't expect them necessarily to keep up with their homework or even to uh, help with household tasks. They may not be able to do that. They may not be able to do their laundry. And it's important to set your expectations accordingly with the recognition that eventually this will pass, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, and getting help for yourself and other family members. Uh, and importantly, having family time that's not tied to discussions of the illness. What happens to some families is they fall into this trap of whenever we get together, we have to talk about his bipolar disorder or her depression. Very important to still have the, you know, the trip to church or the ski trip or the uh, going to the bowling alley or whatever it is that we did it before as a family. Uh, very important to have that regularity and continuity. Next slide. Well, what are some good habits for sleep? Um, sleep is the, one of the number one problems for people with bipolar disorder. They can't fall asleep or they sleep very little. Sometimes you can tie that to they're on the phone with their friends and playing video games all the way up to the moment they go to sleep. And that, of course, never uh, it helps when you have bipolar disorder. Sometimes you find that the kid is texting their friends in the middle of the night the friends are up too, so they're texting back, or they're playing video games late at night. Uh, or the problem may be that they can't get out of bed in the morning. And that is either because they've gone to bed too late, or they might be on a medication that makes it very difficult to get up. A symptom of depression is what we call sleep inertia, which feels, I've heard it described as, it feels like a 100 pound weight pressing down on your chest, even though you want to get up, you can't. Uh, it's like you. I've heard kids say, I want to go to school. It's not that I don't. I can't get myself out of bed. And there's some reality to that. That's part of the illness. So uh, there are some online sleep programs that one can do uh, if you don't want to see a therapist. Um, of course, anything that's uh, uh, an illicit drug or uh, even an over-the-counter substance like Sudafed, never take that at night. Don't take Adderall or one of those, or Ritalin right before you go to bed um, if the kid's on those medications. So, next slide. Um, what are some good sloping, uh, coping strategies? Exercise, of course, particularly for depression. The number one problem with exercise, though, is when people are depressed, they can't do it, or they can do very little of it. Very important to, this is an example of setting your expectations accordingly. Ask the person to uh, build up. So do something very light at first. When they get out of the hospital, maybe all they can do is walk around the block, take the dog for a short walk. Maybe they can build up 
to a short game of tennis or uh, weightlifting in the, in the uh, basement or something. But it, exercise will help mood. It, it's one of those uh, fairly predictably good things to do. I mentioned keeping regular sleep-wake hours to the extent you can with a teenager. Art, music, religion, spirituality, meditation. We're teaching kids meditation more and more. And some, uh, some kids just don't take to it. They say, this is boring. You know, this is like listening to you know, no, uh, white noise or something. I can't just sit here for a length of time. As they get older, they come to appreciate that idea of sitting, observing their thoughts, uh, not trying to chase thoughts away as, most, as much as face them. Um, there's a, a good meditation you can do where you ask if kids are being bothered by thoughts that are going very fast. Think of your thoughts as leaves going down a stream. And each one, watch it go by. There's the worry I have about school. There's the worry I have about my friend Jolene. There's my uh, worry about what's going to happen this summer be able to take some distance from it. That takes some skill to learn those things. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Uh, one of the most important things we do is a prevention action plan. That's where the family sits down and says, what are the early warning signs of becoming manic and what can we do as a family? What can the parents do? What can the kid do? What can the psychiatrist do? Let's all have it in the same place and even tape it to the refrigerator. This is kind of like those uh, uh, um, fire drills we all did as kids. You, know, you have to know what's going to happen, where everybody's going to walk to, where they're going uh, where, where they're going to rest after they leave the building. All those things have to be kind of rehearsed ahead of time. So what it looks like, next slide, is something like this. This is one for a kid named Phil. Uh, he described his manias as coming about when he had arguments with uh, his brother or when he had problems on his job. Uh, uh, some of his early warning signs included uh, irritability, um, being very angry when interrupted. Uh, let's see, where does that one, other one say? Uh, um, can't really read it from here. Oh, yes. Okay, sleeps less, gets up during the night. Uh, coping skills, calling my doctor for medication checks, trying to keep regular bed and wake times, uh, collaborative problem solving with my parents, being able to talk things through. But what are the obstacles? Well, I don't know the doctor's phone number. I can't call the doctor. And also, he never answers, or she never answers. So what are, what are the backup numbers I can call? All those things are good to kind of play out and write down and have a contract that everybody agrees on. And then when the actual symptoms occur, then you have a plan, you know what to do, first, second, third. Now, it may not work. It may be that the kid disappears in the middle of the manic episode and you don't know where they go until the police pick them up. But then at least you have one piece of, of, of data that you can then use for the next episode. How do I know? What were the signs leading up to when he disappeared? What could we do to prevent that? Next slide. Let me say a word about medications, and by the way, I'm not connected up with any drug companies at all. I want to make, make that clear. I don't have any uh, desire to push one over the other. Uh, these are the medications that we currently use for bipolar disorder, and some of them are in the class we call mood stabilizers, like lithium. Some are in the class of antipsychotics, like uh, Zyprexa or Abilify. Probably some of you have heard of Lamictal. That's being used more and more as a mood stabilizer. Um, all of these, some of these have been uh, indicated for kids and other ones not. Uh, most of them have uh, been okay for mania. The ones for depression are a little bit harder to, to choose. Lithium is still the best, the best drug, I think, for bipolar disorder. Um, people don't necessarily like to take it, especially kids, because... It has a stigma. People, kids know about it. It's the drug that, you know, manic, crazy people take. Or, and there are some problems, like it can cause your hands to shake. It can make you urinate frequently or be thirsty all the time. But yet it's the best in terms of preventing mania and does something for depression as well. The antipsychotics like aripiprazole or Abilify or Seroquel 
are meant really to bring someone down from a highly agitated state. We call them antipsychotics, but they're not only for psychosis, they're also for severe agitation. And they have side effects, like the kid can gain weight or feel very fatigued. Sometimes we only put them on that, the, those medications for a short time and then take them off. Uh, so there's a bit of trial and error in all of this. Uh, unfortunately, there are some docs that would just throw every medication at the kid and, you know, oh, well, I started them on lithium, but that didn't work, so I added an antipsychotic, but then the mom called me and said that, uh, that she was uh, um, uh, slowed down, so I added um, Ritalin. And now the mom is calling me and saying she can't sleep at night, so I added an, an antipsychotic, a second antipsychotic. And now I'm adding Ambien to help her sleep. Before you know it, the kid's on five, six medications and don't know which ones are working, which ones are being used to treat side effects of the other ones. So simpler is better for the most part. There are kids who do need two or three or four, but they're rare in our experience. Uh, next slide. Uh, why do people stop taking their medications? This is one of the biggest problems uh, in bipolar disorder is when kids stop taking their medications. Uh, young adults are famous for this. They've gone through a couple of episodes. They're out on their own for the first time. They're in college, perhaps, or in the military, and they just say, I'm not going to do this anymore. This is my parents' thing. I was a teenager, and I was a crazy teenager, and I'm not that anymore. I'm going to go off of them. And sometimes they end up having another episode back home, and the family's got to take care of them again. But it's not only younger people who do this. Sometimes it's people who've been on these medications for years, just decide I've had enough. I don't want to be on these things. It cause side effects. I'm not sure they help me that much. Um, it's important for the person to educate themselves about what the medications do. That's more of an individual decision making. The family can be of help when the person's younger, but at some point they're gonna be out on their own and they have to make that own decision. I can say, one thing that really helps is having a good relationship with the physician who's doing the medications. So if the, if the doctor is just someone they see once every four months and they see them for five minutes and they write the prescription and send them on their way, that's not gonna work. If, that's, if it's somebody they know well, have trusted, have told stories to, have had, maybe had some therapy with, that's gonna be much um, better, greater chance of staying on the medications over time. Next, uh, next slide. What, what can we do to keep people on their medications? Sometimes it's forgetting. I had a, an example of this another, the other day of somebody who was supposed to take lithium at night and could never remember to do it. She missed time and time again. We tried various things like, uh, can you put a post-it note on your, uh, on your mirror ne next to your toothbrush so you can take it at the same time you brush your teeth? None of that worked. What did finally work was changing the dosing plan to the morning, where she took other pills uh, and, when she, and, and vitamins that were important to her. And if, as long as they were connected with those other pills, then she could remember to take them. So there's sometimes simple tricks like that. Um, important to ask, what are your goals? Uh, if somebody is saying, I want to get out of the house, I want to have an independent life, well, is medication going to help you get, get there or is it going to be in your way? Is there a chance it's going to keep you stable enough that you will be able to go to college or you will be able to try out for that movie role you're interested in? Um, there are right and wrong ways to stop medications. You don't want to stop them all of a sudden. You want to do it gradually. If somebody wants to go off lithium, the worst thing they can do is just stop one day because that's when we, saw that we can see suicide attempts and worsening of symptoms. We have to go off gradually and hopefully under a doctor's uh, recommendations. Um, the other thing just to keep in mind though is that the family itself may be giving messages that we liked you better before you were taking medications. This happens a lot in couples, uh, older couples, not older, but even people in their 30s, 40s, uh, the spouse will say something like, you know, you were skinnier and sexier before you started taking that medication. Um, and you used to be sharper minded. You get the sense that, hey, I liked you better before you took this medication. Or you can have a, in a kid case, you can have a split custody situation where in one family, the, the parent is saying, you have to take this medication very regularly 
I'm going to watch you do it. Uh, I'm going to go with you to make sure we fill your prescriptions, get your blood tests. And the other parent is saying, you know, that's something for your, your other parent's house. I know you can't get along with that parent. I couldn't get along with that parent either. And so I know why you're, uh, you don't have to take that medication when you're with me. Or it gives it more, uh, a more of an implicit thing. That, of course, gives the kid free reign to go off of their medications. And so we have to make sure in our therapy we get these couples together, even if they don't like each other. What are you going to do to help your kid here? You have to have a common message you're giving the kid, common parenting plan around psychiatric treatment. Otherwise, it's just a, uh, it, it's going to become chaotic. She's not going to know what you want her to do. So there are some other strategies, but I'll, I think I'll move on in interest of time. Um, what about drugs, marijuana in particular? You're going to hear an awful lot about marijuana being an, a substitute treatment for bipolar disorder. Like uh, kids will say things like, or young adults will say, uh, if I can have my, my gummies or my weed, I can do fine. I won't be anxious. But the evidence shows that, if anything, it actually increases anxiety, especially if you're smoking it all the time. It can also interfere with memory. I'm not one of those people who sa says, hey, that's the evil weed. Nobody should ever touch it. But it does not go well with psychiatric medications. Uh, it's not a substitute for antidepressants, not a substitute for uh, mood stabilizers. Um, we also don't know nowadays what it is that kids are buying. These, some, of these some of these formulations of weed have a lot of other things in them. So I, I worry about kids who are doing that kind of smoking and eating marijuana. Um, next slide. Now, uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot about this, but communication in a family is one thing we really emphasize in our program. We'll have people sit down and say, okay, you're not agreeing on getting the house clean. Let's talk about it. One person talk, the other person listens. So we'll have a rule like that. We'll do a, a role play. Have the child say, well, here's how it's hard for me because I'm depressed. Have the parent paraphrase. Actually, next slide. Um, next, next one. Yeah, this is an example, active listening. Look at the person, attend to what's said, nod your head, say uh-huh, ask questions. Very elementary stuff, but it's great if it can be implemented at the family level. So it's no longer just fighting or task-oriented commands. There's actually people talking about emotions and paraphrasing. And of course, that may not be the natural way that the family communicates, but it's very important, particularly when the kid is getting, uh, is getting over uh, bipolar disorder. I'll give you a, uh, well, I guess I'm kind of running out of time, so let me move on to the one positive thing. Next one, next one. One more, please. Um, well, first, we have done 10 randomized trials of family-focused therapy with medications. By randomized trials, I mean, well, we give people with bipolar disorder, family therapy plus medications versus medications alone or medications with some other therapy. So the typical test of a, of a therapy, we found a time and time again we can reduce rates of recurrence by involving the family and involving the family actively in the treatment. We think that's because it changes the person's view of the family. They're not less susceptible to negative messages or criticism. Uh, and they're all on the same page about the need for medications and an understanding of the illness. Um, the, here's the good news. Bipolar disorder can be associated with creativity. And I want to say a word about that because there's been a lot of press about this. You hear a lot about people who are, uh, a lot of famous actors and actresses have said, I have bipolar disorder. Uh, and there is some evidence for this. Uh, next slide. Um, here is a list of people we think have had manic episodes. Now, this is not psychiatric research. We have not gone back and interviewed Mary Shelley or um, Honor de Balzac. These are based on their life histories. We believe they had manic episodes. Some of them made suicide attempts. Some of them actually committed suicide, such as Ernest, Ernest Hemingway, but we know he had mania and depression. So did Virginia Woolf. Um, uh, Tennessee Williams was hospitalized for depression. So this, there is a, a long pedigree for these kinds of disorders. Next one. 
and likewise musicians. Here's a, a list of some musicians who we believe had bipolar disorder, including uh, Tchaikovsky, uh, Mahler, uh, more recently Kurt Cobain, uh, Charlie Parker had, had bipolar disorder. And what this is all amounting to is the mania seems to be associated with a certain amount of excess, extra creativity. If the person already has musical or writing ability, being manic can actually improve their output. But there's a caveat, next one. Uh, the research does show that creativity is higher in people with bipolar disorder than among compar uh, comparison groups. We know that people in creative professions are more likely to have bipolar disorder than our healthy compar co comparison groups, such as being a writer or a musician. We know that we often find creative people in the families, but it's linked to hypomania, not mania. So the take home here is if you have someone who says, I'm a very creative artist or writer, or I'm a great musician, and these medications are ruining it for me, they're taking away my creativity, the answer is, you, instead of going off the medications, you gotta get them adjusted. You gotta get them adjusted so that you have more freedom emotionally to be able to manage the disorder. Uh, you can get along with a lower dose of lithium, perhaps, that would allow you to still be creative, but not have to give it up entirely and also not have to end up back in the hospital. Kay Jamison, a psychologist, uh, has written a very good book I'd recommend called An Unquiet Mind. It's about her experience of being both bipolar and a professor of psychiatry at, at UCLA, in fact. I knew her well, and uh, I think we're, these are auto, <laughs> these are auto uh, advancing. Um, go back one, please. Yeah, so um, uh, I think the important thing is to make sure that person knows it's hypomania that is likely to help them, not the full mania. What happens with the, in mania is people produce a lot of work, but it's not very good. And what they do their best work when they're a little bit agitated. All right, next slide. So here are some take home messages. Bipolar disorder is highly recurrent and can be disabling. Once stabilized, people with bipolar disorder can often make very creative contributions to society early on, especially during teen years uh, and childhood, but even in early adulthood. You can have uh, uh, the parents end up doing most of the work because you'll see the kids don't think there's anything wrong with them. They don't think there's anything different about them from their peers. Medications are a very important part of the uh, care. Um, we find that you can do best if you combine medication with some family support in the form of family therapy, family groups, something where the family is involved and is on the same page about this disorder. Uh, kids, people can learn illness management skills like keep mood tracking or uh, staying on a regular sleep-wake cycle or tracking their use of medications or reminding themselves to take their medications. All those things will help with stability. And uh, as for family members, remember to take care of yourself. Remember to leave time for yourself to, to reduce your own stress. Next slide. Um, I'm gonna leave you with this quote. This is a quote from Kay Jamison, who I just mentioned. She says, I cannot imagine leading a normal life without both taking lithium and having had the benefits of psychotherapy. Ineffably, psychotherapy heals, makes some sense of the confusion, reigns in the terrifying thoughts and feelings, returns some control and hope and possibility of learning from it all, it is where I have believed or have learned to believe that I might someday be able to contend with all of this. She really spoke to the importance of both having therapy and medications. Next slide. This is my one shameless uh, self-promotion, our book, uh, Bipolar Disorder Survival Guide, where you'll find all this stuff and how to do it, how to put it into action. And next slide. And that's where you can download information from our, uh, and find more information about our clinic. Uh, if you're a clinician yourself or a counselor, there are a lot of these handouts you can use with your own patients that are downloadable. So that's a, a useful site. Uh, 
And with that, I'd like to thank Kay for inviting me and all of you for being here. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, was that awesome or what? Yeah, pretty amazing. Well, as you know, we're going to go into uh, a table discussion time. I think on the next slide there, we'll have some questions for you. Uh, remember that in the middle of your table, we have cards here for your questions. So take that time to write down any questions you have. We'll come by and pick those up and we'll handle them in our question and answer session. So here are three table discussion questions. Just pick one that you want to talk about and we'll pull you in, in a little bit. All right. Thanks, guys. And so a lot of information, but uh, we'll, we'll try to do our best to get through as many of the questions uh, that we can here. Um, why don't I start, I'll start with, uh, I'll start with marijuana. Why don't I start with marijuana? <laughs> uh, Jump in the deep end. Yeah, is it the key that unlocks Pandora's box of the extremes of bipolar one mania? Example, the hallucinations, grandiosity, that kind of stuff. I don't know if that's a... Is key that unlocks Pandora. So does that, I guess that means does it start it or does it? Exacerbate it. Exacerbate it? Yeah, exacerbate it. Okay, does marijuana exacerbate? Exacerbate that, yeah. Or from cause first. Yeah. Well, marijuana doesn't cause the illness in the first place, but certainly if somebody's smoking a lot of marijuana and they're stable, that often leads to them forgetting to take their medications or having sleep disturbance which in itself can be a trigger for mania. I don't think we see very many cases where we can say, well, you smoked weed, therefore you became manic. It's usually a much more a complicated pathway than that. But my concern usually is that when somebody's smoking a lot of weed, they're not properly take, m medicated or getting enough sleep or eating correctly or doing any of those things, all of which can be risk factors. Um, a lot of people asked for um, difference between ADD, ADHD, borderline personality, bipolar, you know, how do you tease all that, all of that out? Very carefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first let me start with ADHD. It's very, uh, first very difficult. If you're looking at a kid who is in a manic state, it can look a lot like ADHD because you can have the hyperactive behavior, you can have the talking fast, but there are certain symptoms that distinguish mania from ADHD. One is elated mood. You don't tend to see that in ADHD. You don't tend to see grandiose thinking or delusions. You don't see hypersexuality, and you don't see a decreased need for sleep because uh, ADHD kids will complain of insomnia, but they're tired the next day and they want to sleep. Uh, and so ADHD kids don't have full manic episodes. The other thing is though, sometimes we have to follow them over time to be sure, because you can have what looks like uh, ADHD, uh, could be mania, could be ADHD. There's a family history of both, so we don't know. Sometimes we don't know until we've tried certain medications. How about uh, uh, borderline? borderline. Yeah, yeah, what about with borderline? So borderline personality, uh, I'm assuming people know something about that, but it's a you know, personality disorder marked by mood instability. People get explosive, they have difficulty with identity, they jump from one relationship to another, and all those things can occur in bipolar disorder. The, the thing is, again, bi uh, borderline people don't become manic. They, you won't see them uh, transition into this really activated delusional state. Bipolar two, where you have depressions with hypomanias, can be very difficult to tell apart. What I do is I usually look between episodes. How do they function when they're not depressed or hypomanic? Do we see that kind of rage uh, jumping from relationship to relationship? Um, here, one day I'm a writer, the next day I'm a, I'm a this or that. Um, not being able to tolerate being alone. If all those things are present in between episodes, then I think we, the person might actually have both. There's a, a both bipolar and borderline personality. The other thing I think that's important is the length of episodes. Mood swings are very quick 
in uh, borderline personality that go in and out of rage, excitement, depression, whereas with bipolar disorder, we're usually talking weeks at a time. So there's some subtleties. Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, that's great. Uh, I had a question here. It, uh, they said, I'm an adult uh, with uh, borderline, uh, or with bipolar disorder, uh, and I'm in a profession that makes it difficult to have regular sleep-wake cycles. How can I get help in regulating this part of the illness? Well, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, because we know that bipolar disorder does best when there is a regulated sleep-wake cycle, um, I, I would have to know more about the actual, uh, whether there's any flexibility, whether, for example, you can be on one uh, kind of shift for weeks at a time and then another shift for weeks at a time, then at least you can adjust when you go from one, uh, one pattern to another. But, uh, for example, if you were an airline uh, host, host or um, uh, working on an airline, you're going to be, you know, flying out late at night one day and early the next day. Or if you're on a contract nurse, you're going to have different shifts. Sometimes it's going to be late at night, sometimes early. One thing you can do if you're willing to work with the employer about providing reasonable accommodations, as we call it, then you can sit down with the employer and say, I need a regular shift. I, I can't be going from one to another. I can't go and uh, be doing it that way. And sometimes they will accommodate. Sometimes they can't. Mm -hmm. yeah, another one on sleep. Someone who's asked, you know, how to, how to establish a healthy sleep pattern. Uh, they're currently on an upward rise to hypomania in a healthy and controlled way on meds, but have a hard, hardest time waking up and self-sabotaging self getting up. Yeah, um, so is it, I think we're talking about the person's feeling hypomanic at night and then can't get up in the morning, or? Uh, yeah, sabotaging getting up, it looks yeah. like, yeah. Um, this, is a, this is something we've been spending a lot of time thinking about, are people who really can't get up in the morning, and there are a couple of things you can do. First, the medications can be adjusted. So that, it, that person may be on a medication that, that really makes them feel uh, worn out in the morning. So if that, sometimes changing the timing of the dosage can be helpful with that. Sometimes uh, people have been known to take a stimulant in the morning, like Adderall, if, if they're really having trouble, if, especially if they also have ADHD, they wake themselves up early. There's actually a version, presumably, of, uh, I believe it's Ritalin, and it's either Ritalin or Adderall, Adderall now, that you can take in the evening, and it doesn't kick in till morning. Mm. So for some kids, that, that is a way to get them out of bed because they're, they're being stimulated. Uh, for adults, coffee, of course, helps. But if you're really severely depressed, it's, it's hard. You have to do it in stages. Some people you know, take three hours or two hours to wake up. And if they plan ahead, that's possible. Mm -hmm. none, um, of those are great, none of those are great solutions, yeah. to be honest. Um, so one of the things that it gets asked a lot is my loved one doesn't really think that he is sick or, or she is ill or I can't persuade her or like if you have a, um, with a child, you can of course take a child to an appointment, but you know, they're over 18 now and having to figure this out and you don't have as much control and, or an adult child, fully adult, how do you, just some tips around helping them either maybe understand or not understand and how to keep helping them anyway and then, or treatment, right. stay in treatment. I think at the beginning of the illness, you want to take, uh, you have to take it slow and you have to educate them about what their disorder is and how it's affecting other people, how it's affecting their, their peers. You know, sibling, uh, adolescents are very concerned about peer relationships. Is it driving people away? Getting them to read about it or watch a TV special about it would be a good thing. If they have a therapist who can kind of take them through, let's look at your behavior across situations and see if this really does fit. Um, or it is, is there another explanation? If they're very wedded to this idea, well, everybody else is messed up and it's, there's nothing wrong with me. Uh, what some parents have done is the tough love approach. They've said at some point, if you're going to live here, you have to be taking medication. I don't particularly like that the way of having to approach it, but sometimes that's the only way. If somebody's doing self-destructive things or putting other people in danger, that's what you have to do. Another question someone asked is, is uh, bipolar disorder hereditary? Yes, uh, this is one of the most hereditary of uh, psychiatric disorders. 
What's confusing about it is it doesn't always happen in the, neck, in the upper generation. So you don't, if you have a bipolar child, it's not necessarily that true that you or your husband or wife has bipolar disorder. It's often a, uh, another generation or it can be multi-generational. The other thing is it doesn't always run with the full bipolar disorder. It runs with depression. So and if we look at these family trees, we'll see bipolar disorder in one generation, depression in another generation, a possible case of bipolar disorder in the grandparent generation, but it clearly does follow a genetic pathway. What we don't know when we talk to people is, was that uncle or aunt really bipolar? All we know is that um, they were in the hospital or they committed suicide. We don't know if that's, that's probably depression. It may have been bipolar disorder or in one family I talked to, uh, all we know about Uncle Fred is he disappeared on a horse one day. Maybe the Indian shot him. Hmm. That's all they were able to tell him about, uh, us about this, this person. Was that person bipolar? Who knows? You know? um, someone asked, if a hospital diagnosed uh, someone as having bipolar disorder, how do you know if the person really has it if they have never experienced hypomania or manic episodes, only depression, possibly um, chronic, and with anxiety? So evidently, hospital diagnosed that as bipolar. So the person has been admitted with mania or? No, it, they said they haven't experienced, it, okay. uh, never experienced hypomania or manic episodes. Right. Well, the truth is we don't know if, what they're, if they've been admitted to the hospital with just depression, we have to look, first we look back at the history and say, is there any period of time that could have been called a hypomanic episode? Or are there any hypomanic-like symptoms that are going along with the depression, such as racing thoughts or feeling very agitated or uh, full of energy one day and no energy the next? And is there a family history? If there is a family history, then we have to be very careful about using antidepressants. But we may still not call them bipolar. We might say, there's major depression, there's an index of suspicion that this might turn into bipolar disorder, but we won't know until we see a manic or a hypomanic episode. That's the, the smoking gun, so to speak. Yeah, another question that, that's come up is, uh, you know, once a, once a child reaches 18 and can make their own decisions, right? So now they're on their own. And I know this is a struggle even for when adults, you know, um, you know start, have, a, have a manic episode or, or display bipolar disorder. Legally, how can the family still have influence so, you know, that they can, you know, help make sure that the treatment's maintained and all that? Because I know that's a big frustration in, in families because a lot of times they're shut out of that or, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, there's two things here. I think one is, is the person uh, willing to hear your advice? Right? Or if they're 19, 20 years old, they may say, I'm done with my parents, I'm gonna make my own decisions. Then I think the parents have to think, well, what, do, what is a kid asking for me? Are they asking for money? Are they asking for use of the car? Do they need a place to live? Can I set up a quid pro quo with them? You get treatment, even if it's only psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. And in exchange, we continue to provide an environment with you. Now, of course, you have to be willing to follow through with it, which could be very difficult to do. The, there's another part to your question, though, which is what, what about the clinician that won't talk to you? Mm -hmm. And the, one thing you can do is get the, your son or daughter to sign the release that you'll need to be able to talk to the, the clinician. I, I personally think the clinician should be talking to you. Um, they, you, know, you need information. They don't have to tell you every... Uh, subtlety that goes on in the psychotherapy, but they need to know, you need to know things like what medications are they on, are they taking them, and are they at the right level, how do we know if they're toxic on lithium, uh, all those things families need to know, and can we call you if we think there's some uh, uh, symptoms developing, so that I think is a conversation to have with the clinician, personally if it were me and I, my kid were seeing a clinician who wouldn't talk to me, I would find another clinician. What about, um, sorry, will you finish there? Okay, um, what about, uh, we haven't talked about schizophrenia and also then the bipolar psychosis that can come along. So how do, um, this question then, and kind of I would say along with that, when an adult uh, person with bipolar tells you you said or did something that you did not say or do that's delusional, does that mean that he's also schizophrenic? Yeah, um, the presence of delusions is not specific to schizophrenia. You can have uh, bipolar disorder and delusions. You can have depression and delusions. 
what we, uh, and of course schizophrenia, um, something like, you know, you said something uh, that you didn't say is not a delusion per mu so much as a misunderstanding in interpersonal communication, unless it's very sort of chronic and um, you're somebody you not who will, other than you say you are, you're my real parents are dead and buried in the backyard and you're not my real parents, that kind of thing is more of a schizophrenic delusion. Uh, and what we look for is what's the dominance, what's the predominance of delusional thinking versus mood swings. So if, they're, if the real presentation is a sort of hyperacted, uh, manic, elated state, and the delusions are secondary and they have a grandiose quality, that's usually bipolar disorder. If there is a full-blown paranoid delusion and the person's depressed as well or something, but the delusion is really what hits you, that's probably more likely schizophrenia. But sometimes, again, we don't know until we've done several, seen several episodes. Yeah. Um, so a another one uh, here that, that, that has come up in a couple of different places is what do you do with a loved one who, you know, maybe they're in the middle of a manic episode or something, they're angry, and they're also telling you, you know, things that you said that you didn't say, right? So now we're having the battle of words and you got mm -hmm. anger and escalation. How do you, how do you de-escalate that? First, don't engage with it. Uh, what I, we tell families is remember the three volley rule. If you've said something negative and they've come back with something negative and you've said something negative, they've come back, it's done at that point. You have to be able to walk away. There's a lot of value in walking away from someone who is you know, really going after you and it's escalating. So try to keep, uh, keep in mind, is this going in a good direction? Is the next thing I'm gonna say gonna help or hurt? Now you may be getting very frustrated, understandably. I never said that. What do you mean I said that you, you couldn't live here or whatever? Uh, and, but you have to be willing to say, this is just going to activate them. We've gotta sit down and have this conversation another time. And sometimes say that to the person, I'm getting too upset. I can't talk about this. Uh, let's talk in a couple of hours when we've both calmed down. So what is, is that what would distinguish the, the type of therapy that, that you've developed, the family focused, um, yeah, that distinguishes it from, from some other type that's of That's a good point because part of what we do is work with those kinds of interchanges and we see them in the sessions. People start getting amped up and criticizing each other and counter criticizing, we say stop. First, put your criticisms in the form of a request. What do you want the person to do? Not what you don't want them to do, okay. not the accusation. Um, let's hear your point of view reflected back first before we make a change or have a plan. Because families sometimes jump to this solution or that and then they can't carry it out because they've never had the full discussion they need to have. Is that type of therapy readily available? Is it pretty localized in, in your clinic and areas? It's area? getting more uh, available. We, we finally put together an online training course for therapists uh, so more people are being trained in it. Uh, unfortunately, it's not as readily available as we'd hope. But there are some online, uh, like the site I gave you, that has a lot of the material on it. Yeah. Awesome. That's all the questions I have here, except uh, for a question about Kanye West, and that just feels like that. Kanye West. I don't want. Yeah. It's like here's the thing. I'm not going to make fun of Kanye West because he is a man I think who is in a lot of struggles and pain. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, so I'm not going to take a cheap shot at Kanye West, other than to say there it feels like there's an example in the public eye of someone really struggling with their mental health and disintegrating. And notice the connection again with the creativity. Uh, creativity. I mean, he's a great musician, right? Um, and uh, that those the two go hand in hand in a lot of people. Yeah. I'll ask one more here. Uh, have you seen increased bipolar episodes with hormonal fluctuations? Good like question. Menstrual cycles, menopause. Good question. Um, certainly, in teenagers, there are girls who, uh, when they're going, having their period for the first time, we see more depression. And by the way, the incidence of depression in girls and boys is about equal until about age 12. And then it, after that, it's three times more common in girls than in boys. And we assume some of that's got to be hormonal fluctuations. But it's not clearly treatable with a hormone regulator. Uh, with our hormones we can give kids, but those don't tend to be antidepressants. Some people stabilize with birth control pills. Uh, they have a lot of trouble with, uh, with depression, 
and they'll take birth control pills and if the if there are episodes are related to their period that can sometimes stabilize people now menopause different animal entirely because some people find that their moods become more stable after menopause some people find there's more mood fluctuations if you think it's related to either you need to see an endocrine specialist endocrinologist and they usually do a series of, of blood tests for different hormones and find out if there's any abnormalities or you know, God forbid there's a tumor or something like that uh, which can uh, can bring about changes in hormone levels yeah well good stuff boy lots of questions like rapid fire boom 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 going through all those all those questions well thank you again so much for being Absolutely. with us um, as you know, we have uh, a number of resources. I think if we kind of take a look at some of the slides, we have our mental health support groups. We have our family grace groups for those who are loved, who have loved ones living uh, with a mental illness. And then we also have living grace for those who have um, a, a mental illness uh, or diagnosis. So those are our two groups there. Uh, another thing I want to mention is we are going to be starting up our bipolar workshop again. Uh, that's going to be starting uh, in March. Uh, Jenny Sladek, are you here somewhere? Jenny, oh, stand up. Come on, stand up so everybody can see Jenny. Here's Jenny. Jenny will be uh, running our bipolar workshop. We've been doing this for how long? Uh, this will be the ninth. ninth year. So uh, we've been doing it for, for a long time. And, uh, and so it's a really, really great way to be educated on it, have support. Uh, it's for those that are living um, with uh, a bipolar disorder, but family can come as well because the education is, is invaluable. So you can come with your, your loved one as well. If you're interested in that and you want to sign up, um, just on your table on just put a piece of paper there, put your name on it and say workshop and we will collect those and get those to you. If you have any questions about it, now you know who Ginny is, you can go talk to her. She's here for any questions that you might have. Again, we're really excited that we get to uh, start this back up again with COVID. Obviously a lot of things, you know, we're, we're re revamping up. So thank you so much to Ginny for doing that. She has a real heart for that. Um, you can see here how to get involved. We've got all these different opportunities for you. Again, you can explore Celebrate Recovery in the back and some of our, our our resources as well. Um, let's get the next slide. Uh, we have the breathe uh, uh, call coming up. You can see right there with um, with Kay and with Ex uh, Xavier Amador. And so that's on January 26th. Uh, I was Amador, to sorry, I said his name wrong. Uh, January 26th at 5.30, so um, you can see all the information there to sign up and get in on that. Uh, again, highly recommended. The, the Breathe Calls, Breathe Retreat have just been uh, amazing opportunities. I've been able to sit in on those, and just the, the community that's built through that as you sort of listen and then you get to talk to one another is just a, a, really, uh, a really great opportunity. And there's the Breathe Retreat, March th uh, 3rd through 5th, and... Uh, so if you're interested in that, get in now uh, early because that fills up fast, okay? And I, we've already got a certain number that have already <laughs> registered, so I don't know how many slots we have left, but d don't delay on this one. Don't go, eh, That's I'll think about moms, it. That's for moms, just to clarify. That's for moms, that yes. for moms, yep. Well, thank you for moms. Yeah, and don't delay on that because you start thinking, eh, by then gone. Okay, so uh, want to get in that uh, if you can. And it's at our uh, Rancho Capistrano uh, campus, uh, and you can see all the information on there. All right, and next month we have um, Bill and Christy Galtier coming. They're the founders of Soul Shepherding, and so they'll be here to talk to us a little bit about the Enneagram. So we're gonna learn something a little different here on personality and things like that. And then I think we got another one. And then in March, Joe Padilla will be here. Uh, he is one of the co-founders and CEO of the Grace Alliance. The Grace Alliance are the people who put together the curricula that we use in Family Grace and Living Grace. And so really, uh, it'll be great to have him here to talk some about that, support groups, how they work, uh, and a lot, of the, a lot of the details behind the scenes. So we're really thrilled to have uh, Joe here with us in March. Okay, I think I hit them all. Yes, thank you for joining. All right. Prayer, prayer. I got one more thing. Wait, there's more. I feel like I use server. All right, so we have a giveaway again, right? Hey, we got raffle. Okay, under your seat, somebody, two of you, have this sticker. Now, the beauty is you got that sticker. I've got two hope bags here with Dr. Miglitz's book in it. You can get it signed. Ooh, you can even get it signed today. So if you have that sticker... Uh, is it a green sticker? 
It's a green one, not, not a piece of tape. That was very creative. So uh, everybody's going to come up with something. So it's a green sticker. Someone's got a green a sticker. If there's anything else under your chair, don't peel it off, because it might be gum. I don't know. You get some, yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good idea. Yeah. Boy, everybody's like, I'm not looking under my chair. Hey, there you go. Awesome, awesome. You got it. All right, thank you guys very much. We'll see you next month. Take care, you guys.